thank you for coming. I just won the bet. Thank you, everyone who sat in the last rows. You just wanted me some money from Pastor Tim. Except, I want everyone up here in the front row. Fill them in. Let's do this thing. No. I'm dead serious. Move it. Pretty please. Pretty please. Let's do this thing. I know we're Lutherans, but we can do this. I have faith. I have faith. I have faith. I'll say, Grandma Kathy, you know better. <laughs> we fill the front first. <laughs> now, and let me help you with this. If you fill the front first, you're farther from the camera. So then they won't see you as easy. See? Yes, this is live streaming. That's why the camera's behind you. But see, then you're not as close to the camera. So, enough said. We've got to move this on before we all melt here. I would like to introduce Pastor Tim Pruitt from Pinal County Cowboy Church, Arizona Casa Grande. He has been our pastor for almost a year now. And uh, the girls and I and Kevin, we've been live streaming in the house. And, uh, and sometimes on the tractor or in the combine, I have been known to screenshot a picture or two and shoot it to him. And even though he's not technically supposed to be on his phone at church, I have been told that he has gone over to my mom and shown him the picture in the middle of church. So he's busted. But no, but further ado, Pastor Tim. Well, thank you, Heather. <clears throat> Thanks to Stephen Jacobson, we're making sure that not only all of you, but the cattle on a thousand hills will hear this presentation. And actually, we appreciate Stephen. Thank you, God, for letting us use the arena for hosting our event this afternoon. And certainly on behalf of the Lord's family, thank all of you for for turning up or turning out for this. I did not bring the hot weather. They've been checking all afternoon. It's cooler in Casa Grande, Arizona on the southwest desert than it is here in sunny North Dakota. So I don't know what's happening. Except for this, I did want to say a few things before we baptize these girls and quite a few things. So if you don't have your bottle of water, you're going to want to grab that. <clears throat> Whoever made that fine dessert, a uh, guy's wife, I want you to know that sugar enables me to preach two to three hours without water. <laughs> that's not really the plan. I've got a phone here that's got a clock on it, but I can't see a thing that says. So, anyway, it is a joy and a privilege. Obviously, some of you know the story. There's kind of a big story behind this. And I'm surprised Heather didn't just blame her mother. That's usually what we do, blame the parents, right? Kathy and Skip attend Cowboy Church there in Casa Grande. Had the privilege of meeting Heather and Josie a couple of years ago. And as we say, the rest is history. This afternoon, I just want to take a few minutes to talk to you about what I believe the Bible teaches plainly and simply. Uh, I don't know if you all got a copy of the Cowboy Life New Testament. I want you to have one of those, our gift to you from the Cowboy Church. Uh, this is similar, but it has the Old Testament in it. And... Pretty much everything I share with you this afternoon, I want you to know that my commitment to you is to only tell you what this book says. Nothing more. I will say nothing less because I, I probably shouldn't say nothing less. That's a lot. There's a lot in the book, right? I don't have time to cover it all, but I want to highlight what the Bible teaches about water baptism. But to do that, we kind of have to back up a little bit and back up the truck. And so a long time ago, someone showed me an illustration that I think is very relevant. I suspect that if I ask you if you believe that this word was true, that the Bible was true cover to cover, I think most of you would probably say you do. However, throughout my life, I've discovered that a lot of people use this book, and instead of having it like this, where this book determines the truth, and I put myself under the truth of the word and try to live by it, many of us in our fine country, we do it this way. I get to decide what's true. I get to decide which piece I want to apply and thus some problems. So as I said earlier, I'm committing myself to only tell you what I can back up and show you right out of God's Word. Uh, obviously, it is a great honor and privilege to be here with the Lars family and with each of you. And before I get real personal, that's all right, I'll try to stay behind the saddle and not get up in your face. Um, Matthew chapter 18 is a passage where we find Jesus with his disciples and in verse 3 of 18, he says, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, 
you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And then you skip down to verse 6 and he says, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Probably not the best verse to use since we've got a little bit of water here. Um, there's no millstones involved, okay? Uh, but that's really why I'm here because the story of Tessa, Harley, and Josie is, is that they believe they've understood from God's word what the Lord Jesus did on their behalf. They have put their faith and their trust in Him personally. And today they want to demonstrate that by following Jesus in believers' baptism. Before I talk about that, though, I want to ask you a couple of questions. They are absolutely personal, the most personal questions, I think, in the world. They're spiritual questions. But I want you for a moment just to think about them. I don't want any out loud answers unless you just can't help yourself. But um, The first question is simply this. Um, if you were, it's always creepy to have to say this, but it's how it goes in life. We're all old, older people here. But if this were to be your last day on this earth and you were to stand before God and you were to look him in the eyes and he were to say to you, um, why should I let you into my heaven? The question is, do you know what the right answer is? And the question that goes with that is, uh, are you absolutely sure this afternoon that if this is your last day on earth that you will spend eternity in heaven with your heavenly father? Now, some have said that, well, it's all a guessing game. There's all these religions, all these ideas. But in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, um, these words say very plainly, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. See, I believe the Bible teaches that God does love us. He cares for us. In John chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then the, the chapter goes on to say that basically God, through His Son Jesus, created everything that we know in life, every farm, every piece of land, every country, every person. And then you skip down to verse 14 of that same chapter, and the Bible says that, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of full of grace and truth, as of the only begotten of the Father. The real teaching of Scripture is there is one true God. He did create everything. But as you read the Bible, you discover that He didn't create that alone. Jesus was with Him, and it is through Jesus that He created everything. And He created everything with a purpose and with significance and meaning. And then Jesus came into this world, he became a man, was born in Bethlehem, lived a life kind of like ours, but the Bible is very clear, without sin. Unlike you and me, Jesus never failed, never came up short, never broke the laws of God, never disappointed, was faithful to God in everything in every way. And so this afternoon, I want to share with you what the Bible calls and what we often refer to as the gospel or the good news. Some of you are familiar with John chapter 3, verse 16. Sounds like I just... I'm still there. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I submit to you that the day you stand before your Maker, I really think I have an idea what He's going to want to talk about. And it ain't going to be about Tim and what Tim tried to do and the things Tim quit doing. And how far Tim was willing to ride Allegiant Airlines to come to North Dakota. I'm just saying. That's not going to be the conversation. And there's a reason I believe that. And it's because in the life and ministry of Jesus, when he wrapped up his time on this earth, you will find this in the very last verses of Matthew's Gospel. In Matthew 28, verses 16 and following, actually if you drop down to verse 18, Jesus had gathered the disciples. He's preparing to go back into heaven, and he says to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe or obey everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. So I believe when we stand before the Father in heaven, 
I got, I got a sneaking suspicion, suspicion he's going to look at me and say, Tim, I want to talk to you about Jesus. What, what do you believe about Jesus? What did you do with Jesus? And for those who claim to be followers of Jesus, I'm pretty sure we're going to talk about these three things. Tim, did you make disciples of all people? Did you baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And did you teach them to obey the Word of God, to obey the commandments of the Lord Jesus? Let me tell you briefly why I believe that's the way it's going to be. Um, in the book of Romans is very plain. That's some of the good news, but here's the bad news. You know I tell you bad news, right? Yeah, that's life. Before there's really good news, there's bad news. The bad news is, the Bible says that we've all sinned. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's bad. But just think about it. You can look around and you can know the way God looks at you and me, we're in good company. All means all. Me, you, every human being that's ever walked on this planet, with the exception of Jesus, sinned, disappointed, did not measure up to God's glory. The worst news, the, the bad news that goes with that is that the penalty of our sin is much different than we often think. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I think sometimes in our country, we've heard the story so many times, in church, out of church, television, radio, that sometimes we take it for granted. Because the New Testament tells us very plainly that Jesus was with the Father in heaven. God's plan for him was to come and live on this earth a sinless, perfect life. So why did he end up dying on a cross? You remember the cross was a Roman instrument of punishment. Today, sometimes we see it as a piece of jewelry, as a symbol of a church. But first and foremost, in the Word of God, it is a, a picture of failure, of punishment, of cruel death. And the story of the Gospel is this, that because I'm a sinner, because I'm born into a world where as soon as I have an opportunity, it's so nice to have kids here because I always have parents who will agree with this, including my parents, as soon as I had an opportunity, guess what? I did what the Bible calls sin. I disobeyed my parents. I did things I shouldn't do. And since then, I've worked really hard to cover up. No, not really. I've worked really hard. To, it's just easy to be honest about that. Um, just because we don't get caught, just because we don't go to jail, just because, and you need to know I am a patriot. I was born in Texas. Just because our nation changes its laws to say what the Word of God says is wrong is now okay, you do know you're not going to stand before the Supreme Court when you leave this earth, right? I mean, they may think they're special, but they ain't that special. We're going to stand beside, before the God who created us, and we will give an account based on His Word, His truth, the final truth. And my Bible says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's code for He don't change. We do the change. We like to change our morals. We change our values. What was wrong 20 years ago is now legal in our country today. But don't you ever kid yourself. The Word of God is given to us as a tremendous gift. God loves you and me so much that He wants us to know the answers ahead of time. He is not interested in any one of us being surprised. The New Testament makes it very plain there's also a place called hell. Hell is real. Hell is hot. Hell is miserable. There's nothing about hell that you want to experience. The reason I can say that, I know, it's not near this hot. I know you are thinking that. Nowhere close. And there's sure not water like this. Um, the Bible te teaches us that hell was created for the devil and the fallen angels. It was not created for you and me. Period. There's nothing about who we are as human beings that was designed to spend eternity in hell. The only people that will find themselves in a devil's hell for eternity are those, according to Scripture, who hear the gospel, hear the story of Jesus, and walk away. And say thanks but no thanks. Somewhere along the line, and you might remember with me how you answered the first question, why should I let you into my heaven? Well, you know, the Bible says, because I am a sinner, I am broken, spiritually bankrupt. There is nothing good in me. On my very best day, my very best week, my very best year, I'm still rotten. There's nothing I can do to pay the penalty of my sin.
Now, now some of you have heard, heard, may have heard that before. You, you may not believe it, but let me just suggest, since we have some homeschoolers in the group, we have to have a little math quiz. Let me suggest, what, what if you only send, I forgot what number I used to use, three times a day. I know, I know that's, that's probably, probably too much. And, and if I told you I sin three times a day, you'd probably get another sandwich and go home. But if you think about actions, attitudes, thoughts, desires that we might act upon, actually just breaking God's law, three would be a pretty good joke, I think. I know a lot of people that are way past three a day. You don't, but I do. That would amount to about a thousand violations of God's law a year. And if you live to be the ripe old age of 80, and you started this disobedience business at the young age of 7 or 5 or 6 or 12, however you want to go, 70 years of 1,000 violations of the law a year. That's 70,000. Now, I used to use this as an illustration. It doesn't work so well in America anymore uh, because there are some places that the law of the land is happy to just say it's okay if you break the law 70,000 times. We don't want to enforce it. Uh, but what would we think of a judge who, if I stood on trial, said, Prut, we can prove that you've broken the laws of the land 70,000 times, but we're going to give you a pass. That ain't flying. And the God of the universe who created us, who wants the very best for us, when he laid out his law, the New Testament says the purpose of the law is to reveal our hearts and to reveal our need for help, for a Savior. Plain English, the law is tough, and it shows us that nobody can measure up. And the great story of Jesus is Jesus came to this earth to show us how to get to the Father. And what you find throughout the New Testament is Jesus calling people to simply put their faith in what he would do on the cross for them. You see, when Jesus went to the cross, some of us have been led to believe that he was forcibly taken. That he was captured, that he had no choice in the matter. If you'll read the Gospels, you will find that Jesus is the Son of the living God at any point. Through his betrayal, false trial, at any point, he could have called legions of angels to his rescue. He could have wiped out every government, the Roman government, the Jewish religious leaders. He could have raised them to the ground. But he didn't because he was obedient to his Father's plan. He voluntarily went to the cross. That day after they beat him almost to death, after they spit on him, after they mocked him, after he carried his cross up the hill, the cross was laid on the ground. He voluntarily laid his body on that tree. The Roman soldiers did their job. They nailed him to the cross. They suspended him between earth and heaven. And he was not rescued. At one point, he cries out to his father, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'll tell you why the Father in heaven turned his back on his only son. Because the word of God says he took your sin and my sin, the sin of all people of all time, and he placed them on his perfect sinless son. And Jesus paid the price. He paid with his lifeblood. He poured out his life so that I would never have to give mine. And the great good news of the gospel is that though there's nothing I can do to rescue myself, to save myself, Jesus has made a way. I want to read a whole lot more scripture to you. We have so much sunlight. My goodness. Why should do that? John chapter 1 verse 29 says, when John the Baptist was out baptizing people, that a certain day Jesus came by, and here's what John said. He saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Those Jewish followers of Jesus and those followers of John the Baptist, when they heard that phrase, they immediately remembered the Old Testament, the system of animal sacrifice. The Old Testament Hebrew word for atonement is covering. When people sin, they bring an animal, like the prize cow, or the prize sheep, or the prize ram, the best of the best, no blemishes. The Jewish people were led to understand that sin is costly and will cost your very best. And the animals were slaughtered and sacrificed. Their blood was shed. And the Bible says that blood covered their sin. It didn't take it away. It just covered it. 
because all of history has looked to the day when 2,000 years ago, Jesus shed perfect blood. And as the perfect Lamb of God, He was the only one qualified to take the sacrifice for our sins and to offer that sacrifice to His Father in heaven and say, with my blood, with my life, I will pay for Prut, for Tim, for his sin, so that when he puts his faith in me, that sin can be forgiven. The word forgiven, by the way, simply means taken away. God really doesn't forgive people because the word means taken away. If God forgave us for the stuff we did, God would take us away. That's not a pretty thing. It's like taking taken behind the woodshed. But God forgives our sin. Because Jesus paid the full price when we come to him and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy of you. Forgive me. Take away my sin. Cleanse me of my sin. He takes that sin and takes it as far as the east is from the west. Buries it in the depths of the sea. And that sin is no more separating your Father in heaven and you. So the big question is this. How... Can you go from being under sin to going back up? If you can't say with absolute assurance, I know for sure when I die, I'll go to heaven, you should ask yourself, why is that? And if your answer is, well, because I haven't been good enough, I haven't done enough good things, I haven't gone to church enough, on and on. If your answer has all to do with you, then I suggest you not really heard what the Bible says and what Jesus offers you. Jesus comes into a world that is broken to people that are broken and he says to us I will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. But here's the biggie. I started out with that about children being converted. The way we receive the gift of forgiveness the way we receive eternal life the way we receive Jesus as personal Savior and Lord of our life is by faith. By the way John chapter 3 if it had been a little cooler, I would have asked you to stay all night. And I would have enjoyed preaching through many of these chapters. Whether you would have enjoyed it or not is a different story. But John chapter 3 tells about a guy named Nicodemus. There was a man named of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Listen, he was a ruler of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God. For no one can do these signs unless those that do them unless God is with him. Let me tell you what a Pharisee is and what that means. That means this guy Nicodemus was a big kahuna. He was a ruler of the Jews. He was a top of the heap religious leader. As a Jew, he would have been circumcised on the eighth day of his life. He would have been set apart for God. And because he was a ruler, he obviously studied with the rabbis and knew the Old Testament better than most of us know the Old or New Testament. He came to Jesus by night. Do I need to explain why? Jesus was a bit revolutionary and was not received by his own people. And here's what Jesus said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus answers and he says, Are you talking about I have to go back into my mother's womb and be born? And Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. That's in John chapter 3. I want you to know that because something about being in this country, somehow some people may think that Billy Graham came up with that phrase or Jimmy Carter or who knows what. But listen, Jesus said those words a long time before those guys ever walked on the earth. And Jesus said those words to a very religious man who would have assumed because of his birthright that he was going to heaven. But Jesus loved him enough to tell him the truth. And Jesus says to him, no, you must be born again. And don't misunderstand this. I have women in the audience to testify. Before I was born, I'm told that my mother's water broke. And before any of us were born, that's how that happens. That's what it means to be born of water. So that's your physical birth. Nobody's going to see and know the kingdom of God. You've got to be born first. You've got to receive physical life that God gives to you. But secondly, you must be born of the Spirit. And Jesus goes ahead to talk about that. It's a God thing. I believe that what God did through Jesus on the cross is so real, is so personal, that one day every person will stand before God and give an account. You know what? 
I come from a Christian family. My grandfather on my mother's side lived his life and served his life as a pastor. My parents were missionaries to West Africa when I was a boy. I heard those preachers talk about drug problems. I had a drug problem when I was a child. I was drugged to church every time the doors were open. That's how much I was in the church, but guess what? I came to the place I understood that no matter how much my parents loved Jesus, and no matter how much my grandparents served Jesus, that what Jesus had done for me required a personal response. It was up to me to choose to trust Him and Him alone. That's what faith is. Some people have a hard time with faith, understanding faith. One of my favorite stories, uh, the name's probably not right, probably not even a true story. But it's better if you think it is. I don't know. How far is the tallest skyscraper from here? Let's just say New York City. I don't, you know, whatever. I don't even like to go to Phoenix. But years ago, there was a guy, the great Zambini, tightrope walker. They stretched the wire between two high-rise buildings over a busy street below. A crowd gathered and looked up in the sky, and they saw him. Everything in the city came to a halt, and the great Zambini walked all the way across. And when we got to the other side, they brought him a wheelbarrow. People were saying, no way. He takes that wheelbarrow, he rolls it all the way across. hundred feet above the street below. All the way across. And he got to the other side. He asked the crowd, how many of you believe that I can do this again? The crowd erupts, they clap, they holler, of course, we've seen you, you can do it, Zambini. And then he asked the question, if you believe I can do it again, one volunteer, will you come up and get in the wheelbarrow? And of course, the crowd grew silent. And so it is, when we hear what Jesus did on our behalf, when we hear the story that the God of heaven, who knew no sin, became a man, lived a sinless, perfect life, was rejected by his own, went voluntarily to a place of punishment and cruelty, and allowed his life to be taken from him and his blood to be spilled. The Bible says he did that for you and for me. And the New Testament says that for us to be born again, we must see that what God has done, He has done for us, and He offers it to us as a gift. And the only way we receive that gift is through choosing personally to put our faith in this Jesus and say, Jesus, I believe it. I trust my life to You. I walk away from everything else, and I put my faith in You and in You alone. I believe that you are who you claim to be. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of my sin. And come live in my life to be the rightful Lord of my life. And that decision is made personally. It's a decision of the heart. I know when I made that decision. If you've made that decision, you've never forgotten it. Because what man, what woman, lightly, talks to the Father in heaven and frivolously says, forgive me of my sin and be master and Lord of my life. You see, the word Lord does mean boss, and I'm pretty sure of this. Somebody shows up on your farm and tells you what a great tractor driver they are and how much experience they have and how ready they are to work, and you've got work to do tomorrow morning. If they're not there by sunup, That's just talk, right? Faith is about taking action on what you believe. Faith is about saying, not only do I receive the gift of eternal life, but I'm going to truly allow Jesus to be Lord and Master the rest of my days. People always get under the load on this one. I read those verses earlier where Jesus said, make disciples. That's what it is. A disciple is someone who chooses to sign up for the Jesus school. You basically say, I know there's all these religions and theories and stuff. But I'm signing up with Jesus. I'm signing the dotted line. I'm giving my life to Him just like those first disciples did. I will live with Him. I will listen to Him. I will follow Him all the days of my life to the best of my ability. The last part of that, by the way, says, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. One reason I get up every day and try to read God's Word is because I ain't there yet. I know that if I die, I'd go to heaven because Jesus paid the price for me. I know that I belong to him because of what he did on my behalf. He's taken me in. I'm part of his family. But 
until I die or until he comes again, my job on this earth is to listen, to learn, to truly let him be Lord of my life, to follow after him. In the middle of that, by the way, is the baptism piece. Make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want you to hear me very, very clearly. This book nowhere teaches that water baptism saves a single soul. It does not wash away sin. I don't know why it is. Actually, very few Christian churches even teach that. But it's amazing how many people think that water can take away sin. This book says, my sin is so evil. My sin is so powerful. My sin has so stained my life that only the blood of Jesus, only life for life, takes care of its consequences. Furthermore, even though we filter this water, it does not look so clear to me. I'm sure with some soap I could get clean, but just on the outside. Water does not wash away your sin problem. Water does not fix anything between you and God. Being born again, putting your faith in Jesus, trusting Him, is where new life in Christ begins. And that's personal, and that's something that happens inside the heart and the spirit of every man, woman, boy, or girl who says, I've heard this story, I believe it, and I'm going to let Jesus lead my life from now on. So what's water baptism about? Well, and why do we practice water baptism? By the way, the pattern you will find, and by the way, the reason I want you to have a New Testament, a copy of the New Testament, is that what I'm going to tell you, if you have a few more months, years, you want to take the time, it only takes a few months to read through the New Testament, I'd be happy for you to read it and see. But the word baptism, by the way, in the Greek, and I've studied Greek, I've studied it well enough in school, that word always means immerse or put under. In the Greek New Testament, the word baptize, it's not even an English word. If you are reading Greek to you, the word would be baptizo. It's a word that the letters were taken from the Greek alphabet and just transferred into English. So we kind of have put meaning to it. But in the original language, it always means to immerse, to put under, to dunk. That's why I got a lot of water in the tank behind me. It doesn't mean the other things that we attach to it. It just doesn't. Every account in the New Testament of a person being baptized is a person who has first heard the gospel, put their faith in Jesus, and then chosen to be baptized in water. Beginning with none other than Jesus himself when he was 30 years old. Jesus didn't need baptizing to wash away sin. Remember, he didn't have any. Jesus was baptized to set a model and a pattern for all of us. To be a follower of Jesus, that's the first place he takes you. It's to the Jordan River, to a body of water. There's many, several accounts in the New Testament. I hope you'll read them. By the way, if we don't, since I don't have time to tell all of them, aren't you glad? In the green book on the table, if you look at Lesson 7, you'll find several examples, most of them from the New Testament, of what New Testament baptism is. And by the way, let me tell you a little story about what the picture is. The picture is not getting washed. This is not about being washed in, even in the blood. What happens because Jesus died for me is that for me to come to faith in Christ, I must die to myself, I must die to sin, I must die to everything else that I might have the life that Jesus has for me. As a boy in West Africa, my dad would go to the villages and preach and teach this simple story. Those that put their faith in Jesus would be given the opportunity to follow him in water baptism. He used to carry around this wooden box. It was a good foot deep or more. Maybe it was a foot and a half. On top of the luggage rack of our station wagon. And a tarp. And when these men and women were ready to be baptized, he would put that wood box down, put the tarp in it, fill it up with water. And then they would get into the water and he would put them all the way under the water. It happens to be the way I was baptized as a young person. But one day he was at a village preaching, and lo and behold, a bunch of people decided they wanted to believe in Jesus. They put their faith in him, but he had forgotten the box. He had the tarp, but no box. The wood planks are not easily available in an African village. And so he had the men of the village take their short handle holes that they farmed with and had them dig a hole in the ground. And as they did that, he realized that's exactly how you would dig a grave. And after the hole was dug in the ground, the tarp was put in there, and the ladies with headpans out of the well filled it up with water. And that's how they were baptized that day. You need to understand, water baptism is a picture of the death, burial, 
and resurrection of Jesus. It is a water grave. The picture is, when we put these girls under the water, we're, they're saying to you, at some point in their life, they turn from sin and self, they died to what they wanted, so that they might come alive in Jesus. And so when we put them under the water, they're buried in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. It's a picture. A picture story. That's why Jesus commanded us to do it. The best reason to follow Jesus in baptism, if you say he's boss, I think it's a good idea to do what the boss says. I commend these young ladies for hearing, for believing, and for following through and doing what Jesus asked them to do. Would you bow your heads and your hearts with me for just a moment? With your heads bowed, your eyes closed. You know for sure when you leave this earth, you'll spend eternity in heaven. Listen, if you're not, it's not at all anything to be ashamed of. But I want you to know the Word of God teaches plainly that God loves you, that it does not have to be a limbo situation. It does not have to be, I hope so. It can be, I know absolutely for sure, because I have put my faith in Jesus the Christ, that my sins are forgiven, all sins, present, past, and future, that I have been made a child of the living God, that when he comes again or when he takes me home, I will go to him because his life is in me and I am in him. That sense of knowing, that absolute assurance comes when we follow Jesus' commands. I can tell you this, you will never get to that point by depending on yourself, by depending on your good works, by depending on church attendance, by depending on baptism, by how many times you take the Lord's Supper or communion, whatever. You, you'll just never get there because every night when you go to bed, you'll have to ask yourself, have I done enough? God's Word expresses God's heart. God loves you so much and He loves me so much. There is no way that He expected any of us to live a day on this earth with that heavy, heavy load of fear and guilt and everything that comes with it. Instead, He gave us His best. His best was totally obedient. Died in our place. I can't think of a better time if you've never put your faith in Jesus and you've never trusted Him personally, I can't think of a better time than right now for you to make that decision. But it's your decision. And right where you sit, the God of heaven knows your heart, knows your mind. And you can open your heart to Him, confess your need for Him, plead for His full forgiveness and pardon, Ask Him to take over your life. Father, I pray as we listen for Your Spirit this evening that we would know how much You love us and care for us. That we would have faith to believe that Your way is the best way and that You are absolutely trustworthy. Father, I'm so grateful this evening that You keep all of Your promises to Your people so grateful for what you did for me through your perfect sinless son. Father, I pray right now that if there is a person here who has not made that personal decision, who cannot remember the time when they said absolutely yes to Jesus and Jesus alone, Father, I pray you would give them courage, but most of all that you would just draw them to that point. That they would choose Jesus and Jesus alone and surrender their hearts and their lives to you. God, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. These girls, originally were going to try to come to Arizona. I don't know about all of them, but I think at least one of them wanted to sneak off down there to Cowboy Church and get this done. Instead, I found out I'd just sneak up here. There's a long story behind that. I'll spare you. But, about a week ago, it occurred to me, I've never done a secret or private baptism. And I'm so grateful that Heather has bombarded the world of North Dakota and beyond with invitations for people to come and to witness 
these girls following Jesus in believer's baptism. Because only Jesus saves, only his blood can cleanse us from sin, only the life of Jesus gives us eternal life. But once that's real, Jesus says, next step, you need to follow me in water's baptism. Because this is the first step for us to communicate to the world, I've chosen Jesus, I'm his follower. The next step, well, I'll tell you that, that's, that's the life stream. If you don't have a home church, and if you don't have a church that teaches you to obey everything that Jesus commanded you, then you can join, join the Lord's family and worship by live stream. We didn't ever finalize this. You going to open your house Sunday? <laughs> we, we have services at 9 o'clock and 10.45 a.m. I was doing the math. That's 11 a.m. for the first service. But the business cards have our website. Of course, you're welcome to log on and check it out yourself. We'd love for you to do that. But we're going to baptize these girls, and we're going to do that first, and then we're going to give anybody else an opportunity to profess their faith. Public profession of faith. In my background and heritage, we used to think that, that meant you'd stand up and tell people when and how and where you came to faith in Jesus. And that's an important thing to do. But as I read the New Testament, I find time and time again, when people saw their need for Jesus, put their faith in Him, almost immediately... They followed him in believer's baptism. They surrendered themselves and said, I'll do what Jesus calls me to do. I'll draw this picture so that my world will know this is my decision. So girls, you ready to get her done? That's yes. Come on, Tessa. <laughs> I, I usually do this outside without the microphone, so I'm going to try this with the microphone. And if you want to take pictures, you're welcome to do that. Our custom at Cowboy Church is this is celebrating time because obviously what Jesus did for us is very serious. But once he saves us and sets us free, and once we choose to follow him in obedience, I can tell you now, that's only good. You're going to have to come back around here, Kathy, because she's going to get out right over here. Come step right around here, Tessa. I want them to see you. They want you on camera. <clears throat> Turn this way. Usually we're not doing this one. Too. Yeah, it's bright, isn't it? Eat the sun. I think all of you know her, but this young lady is Tessa. Tessa, are you sure that you've put your faith in Jesus alone as Savior and Lord of your life? Yes. And Tessa, you understand this baptism will not save you or keep you saved, but it's simply your way of telling the world that you're a follower of Jesus. Yes. And Tessa, upon your profession of faith and in obedience to Jesus' command to make disciples and to baptize them, we're going to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Step into the water. Don't break the pot. Oh, we didn't have a solar blanket. Sorry. Sit down like you're in a bathtub and I'll wait till you catch your breath. <laughs> See, you're so close. No backing out now. I didn't tell you. You're going to pinch your nose with one hand and put the other hand on top of it. You ready? So pinch. What? You're going to pinch your nose so we don't get water up there. And you're going to put this in here. You ready for this? We're going down. Buried with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in newness of life. Breathe. It's cold. <laughs> Come on, step out. She said, this isn't a photo op. Just because we got the video. Come on, Harley. This is where Harley's trying to chicken out because it's, it's not cold. It's cold to Tessa, but not to Harley. And it's Harley's idea, she said. You gonna go in with your shoes? They need washing anyway. It's all right. I don't care. Sure. All right. Let me show this here. This is Harley. Harley, are you sure that you've put your faith in Jesus alone as Savior and Lord of your life? Yes. And Harley, you understand that this water baptism will not save you or keep you saved, but it's your way of telling these folks that you're a follower of Jesus. Yes. And Harley, upon your profession of faith and in obedience to Jesus' command to make disciples and to baptize them, we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Step into the water. Step into the cold water. You yeah, sit down this way like you're in a bathtub. No, with your feet this way. She won't panic. Did you not watch your sister get baptized? Once you get all down, you're going to grab your nose with one hand. There you go. Buried with Christ in baptism. <laughs> Raised to walk in newness of life. I like the ones that help me do that. Yeah, you got that. This is where you go, wait, wait, get the towel. 
Come on, Joseph. Now, these all three told me they want to do this ahead of time. Don't you think I'm pulling them out of the crowd? Josie, are you sure that you put your faith in Jesus alone as Savior and Lord of your life? Yes. And you understand this water baptism doesn't wash away any sin, doesn't keep you saved, but is your way of telling folks that you're a follower of Jesus. Yes. And Josie, upon your profession of faith and in obedience to Jesus' command to make disciples and to baptize them, we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Step into the water. Watch the Bible. Stay close so I don't have to bend over and fall in the water. Sit down like the bathtub. There you go. Pinch your nose. And buried with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in newness of life. Good job, Josie. And because I believe God's always at work inviting people to Himself and to believe in His Son, and is always at work in the hearts of men and women, inviting them to trust in Jesus and to follow Him. It's our custom at Cowboy Church to give another invitation and to give anyone else an opportunity to say, I want to do what Jesus commands, and I want to declare publicly my faith in Him. So if you'd like to do that, you step right up. Whether I know you or not, I'm going to ask you the same questions I asked these girls. And if you can answer the same way, I will be happy to help you follow Jesus in believer's baptism. Nervous. <laughs> You're nervous. The water's just cold. Yeah, that's what I'm you need to be nervous about everything else. <clears throat> Bree, correct? Yes. This young lady is Bree. Bree, are you sure that you have decided and put your faith in Jesus alone as Savior and Lord of your life? And you understand this water baptism won't save you or keep you saved. It's just your way of going public and telling folks you're a Jesus follower. Yes. Then Bree, upon your profession of faith and in obedience to Jesus' command to make disciples and to baptize them, we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Step into the water. Step into the cold water. See, you're tough. Come back over here so I don't have to fall in water. You don't bounce your head. Pinch your head. You ready? Buried with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in newness of life. Good job. Come on. He's afraid the water's going to evaporate. It's not in the Bible, Stephen. Yet. Yet. The Bible's finished. You don't have to worry about it. But, stranger things. Stephen. Y'all know Stephen? This is the guy that's responsible for broadcasting this little service to the world. I deeply appreciate that. Stephen, are you sure that you have personally put your faith in Jesus alone as Savior and Lord of your life? Yes. Stephen, you understand this water baptism cannot save you or keep you saved, but it's your way of going public and telling folks you're a follower of Jesus. Correct, yes. And Stephen, upon your profession of faith and in obedience to Jesus' command to make disciples and to baptize them, we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Step into the water. Watch the pipe. That's not a part of what I usually say. Well, that's Kathy saying that, so I didn't put that in there. You want to stay closer? Sit down like you're in the bathtub. In the very cold bathtub. I'll let you catch your breath. Paint your nose. You ready? Buried with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in newness of life. You. You're so welcome. He's not as young and stout as these girls. He'll be happy to give an assist. The sun is very bright. That's why they were all squinting. Not the one in the west. Come on, I knew that. Get over there. <laughs> All right. Full disclosure, I did have an opportunity to meet Bree and visit with Bree briefly yesterday, and I visited with Stephen for a few days. But the invitation still holds. By the way, I could have said this earlier. Um, some traditions, y'all cold yet? No, okay. Some traditions tie water baptism to church membership and a lot of other stuff. Uh, Cowboy Church, a long time ago. 
we decided that we wanted to be as true to the scripture as possible. And when someone says, I'm a follower of Christ and I want to be obedient to him and do what he commands me to do, we want to help folks do that with no strings attached. The string that's attached, if it's to make a difference in the world, is the string of our lives and our hearts to the Lord Jesus himself. And so I want to share that with you because many of us come from different backgrounds, different churches or beliefs. That's not what this is about today. This is about your personal decision to trust Christ. And then should you choose your personal decision to go public with that. So anybody else before we drain the water? Fantastic. Let, let me encourage you. When we break up here in a minute. If you want to know more about what I shared with you about knowing God personally, being sure of your standing with Him, that big bright red book. It's almost like baptism. You're not going to be able to sneak one away. Everybody's going to see you. So there's enough for everybody to have one. It is a simple Bible study. Questions and answers. Every answer comes from the Word of God, period. So if you want to know what the Bible plainly teaches about this relationship with God, please take the book, work through it. If you have questions, call Heather. I mean, you can call me. You got my business card. You can call me. Um, and then as I mentioned, the Green Book is really just designed to help people start that journey of hearing, listening, and obeying the commandments of Jesus. I want to take this opportunity on behalf of the Lars family to thank all of you for coming out this evening, for sweating like you lived in Arizona, for enjoying the wonderful meal that they put together for us, and most of all, for supporting these girls if they've gone very public with their commitment to Christ, as well as Bree and Stephen. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me and give me the opportunity to pray for these guys? Father in heaven, I thank you again for the day you've given to us. Father, I pray that we would never, never, and ever forget what it is that you have done for us in your Son, Jesus the Christ. Father, I pray for these today, for Tessa and Harley, for Josie, for Bree and Stephen, as they've taken this step in their relationship with you, to simply do what Jesus did, to simply do as Jesus commanded, to simply do it in such a way to clearly communicate that their faith is in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus alone. Father, I pray that this would be the first step of many steps for each of these, that they would continue to love you, they would continue to learn from your Son, and they would continue to also make disciples, to baptize them, and to teach them everything that you've commanded us. Father, I humbly pray all these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, you can't turn the music on, can you? That's it. We're done. You're welcome to grab some water, grab another sandwich. You can ask 21 questions, but only privately, <laughs> if you can find me. Thank you, guys.